Eric, thank you so much. I think that's really one of the most thoughtful, eloquent, flattering uh, introductions I've ever had. Uh, I'm going to cherish being likened to Mahatma Gandhi and Tiger Woods in the same paragraph. Uh, I think this is a first and a last. Um, and I'm also so grateful to you for saying what no one has ever said, but which is what I feel, which is most of my previous books aren't travel books, and this one, which doesn't seem to be, is a travel book. So you, as a fellow traveler, in many, many senses, could see that. And um, thank you so much. I think you can all understand just how honored and thrilled I am to be uh, introduced by Eric Weiner. Uh, we have many places in common, as you gather, uh, Iceland among them, uh, Japan, India, uh, the travel book circles and the travel book pages. Um, and I think like most of you, uh, I've been listening to him and also reading him uh, for more years than I can count. Uh, and these days, I think when we, hear, when we think about happiness or about travel, the first person we think about is probably the Dalai Lama, but the second is probably Eric Weiner. Um, and so it's a great honor uh, to have him here. And it's also very gracious of him to give up his uh, free time to, to, to come and be here. So I'm really appreciative of that. And uh, as you can tell, I'm just, as all of us are, I think, so thrilled uh, to be in this school with its celebrated history of, uh, of peace, I think, of silence, uh, of global vision, and, of course, of deep concern about uh, both China uh, and Tibet. Uh, and as Ariana was saying, this, this small evening has been more than a decade in the making. So I really appreciate Jack and Ariana and Alka and all their colleagues uh, for, for making it happen. Uh, left to my own devices, all I really want to do is to talk uh, over there with Eric uh, and to get at the heart, the essence of certain essential questions like um, whether there's better Indian food in Japan or Japanese food in India. Uh, I want to see if uh, Eric can tutor me in Hindi. Needless to say, he speaks good Hindi. I speak none at all. Uh, and just to, you know, to travel the world with him. But I have been asked uh, to, to talk to you for, for 35 minutes beforehand. Now, Eric and I were saying on our way over here that uh, as soon as somebody gets up to a podium like this and starts speaking, everybody falls asleep, including the person doing the speaking often. Um, but uh, if you fall asleep, you will soon wake up uh, as we continue our conversation over there. And thank you all very much, all of you, for coming out on, the, on a rainy, unspring-like evening. Uh, I was thinking as I was coming down here um, from the hotel past all those uh, formidable institutions and, and embassies that uh, when I was two years old, it probably still applies, uh, I didn't know and I didn't care much about world events. But amazingly, there was one event that really stuck inside my mind, even in my infancy. Uh, and that was this story of a young king fleeing over the highest mountains in the world to try to get to safety and a new life in exile. And these were the last days before television. My parents and I were living in Oxford, England, uh, and we just had this scratchy radio on a shelf. And every day at 7 p.m., my father would turn it on and out would crackle this distant report, not from Eric and NPR, but in those days from the BBC. And one day we heard that uh, the young king was a little closer to freedom. And one day we heard that his pursuers were gaining on him. Uh, one day we heard that there was a mysterious plane circling overhead and nobody knew if it was friend or foe. And finally, after 14 days of tuning in at 7 p.m., we heard that um, the young king had made his way across the border into a new life in exile. And my father, who was a professional philosopher, uh, and was deeply interested in Buddhism and actually in all other religions, sailed all the way back from England to India in order to meet uh, the newly arrived Dalai Lama. Uh, and the Dalai Lama then, as now, was very keen to really open his door to everyone and realized that in exile he could actually engage in much more various conversations than he had in Lhasa. So he invited my father to come and see him in his temporary home in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, and uh, my father, as, as you already heard, uh, was uh, deep in research on Gandhi at the time. And of course, the Dalai Lama, newly arrived in exile, was thinking with new intensity about how the Gandhian president and how to lead a nonviolent resistance to an occupying power, just the kind of force that the school represents. So they had a, a long and I think a fruitful conversation. And at the end of it, I guess, you know, like any proud dad, my father said, well, Your Holiness, I've got this little three-year-old boy back in Oxford, England, and he took this unusual interest in the story of your flight. And the Dalai Lama, with his perfect gift, even then for the perfect gesture, found a picture of himself when he was five years old 
already on the lion throne in Lhasa and sent it to me through my father. Uh, so I made the connection very early on. Of course, I, as a typical three-year-old, I didn't really know who or what a Dalai Lama was, but I only had to look at the picture um, to feel that this was somebody not so different from myself. And I think the Dalai Lama's gift has always been that whomever he meets, he finds the common ground. And so you see a sort of reflection of your better self. Uh, and I remember vividly to this day that every now and then I'd begin to feel a bit sorry for myself. And I think, well, you know, life is kind of difficult for a little boy uh, in a foreign country by himself. And then I only had to look at the photo of a five-year-old boy, already ruler of six million people, and I was freed from self-pity. Uh, things were put into a useful perspective. So I put the, the picture on my desk, and then we moved to California shortly thereafter, and it stayed on my desk. And then, as is the way of the world, a forest fire struck up half a mile away from our house and reduced the house and everything in it, including the photograph, to ash. And in some ways, I think, really brought home the meaning of the photograph, which is the first law of Buddhism, impermanence, that you can't hold to photographs, you can't cling to the stuff of the world. But if you keep inside you the values or the possibilities that the photo points to, then that can withstand tsunami or, or earthquake or flood or, or, or forest fire. But the photo really itself can only at best be a pointer. Well, the second uh, part of this process was that when I was 17, uh, I went back for the first time ever to my ancestral homeland of India uh, to meet the grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins I'd never really had a chance to meet. And my father uh, decided that part of the program would involve meeting the Dalai Lama. And I say with some embarrassment now, I was a typical 17-year-old. I wanted to meet either Jerry Garcia or Leonard Cohen. Uh, but to meet a professional philosopher and something of a colleague of my father's was not high on my wish list. Uh, but I was 17, so I had no choice. Um, and we went, as travelers do to this day, uh, to Delhi, uh, the, the station in Old Delhi, took the overnight train to this little town called Patan Kot, got out there and into a taxi for the winding four-hour trip zigzagging around the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, Dharamsala in 1974 was really just a scatter of huts along a hillside. And we drove to the last house on the road, a very, fairly modest yellow cottage, rang the bell and went in to see the Dalai Lama. Nobody was really knocking on his door in those days. Uh, and I see that some of you are from India, and you at least will probably know that Dharamsala is the single rainiest and most monsoon-stricken town in the whole of India. And this was the height of the monsoon season, August. But somehow or other, there was no rain that day, but there's a very, very thick fog. So as I was sitting in the Dalai Lama's room, which has large picture windows looking out on the Kanga Valley below, all I could see was this thick, impenetrable mist. No houses, no humans, no sign of the real world, as, as I understood it. And it seemed to me almost as if these two philosophers were sitting on top of a mountain talking about compassion and, and reality and emptiness. Uh, in my ignorance, I didn't know that the Dalai Lama had already been dealing with Beijing for 25 years at that point. And of course, I couldn't understand almost most of what they said, but something, I think, important stuck. And that meant that as soon as the Dalai Lama made his first trip to this country, five years later in 1979, I went to hear him. And then in the 1980s, he began to come a little more often, and I would see him fairly regularly in New York. And again, it's remarkable now to think back that in 1984, for example, almost nobody really knew, knew who or what a Dalai Lama was, whether he was a person out of legend or whether he was a real human being. He would hold press conferences uh, in, in New York, four people would show up, three Tibetans and me, usually. Um, I just on my way here met a, a, a colleague of mine from Time Magazine, and I was remembering in 1985, I set up a lunch for the Dalai Lama with uh, my colleagues in Time Magazine, and about two hours before the lunch, one of them rang up and said, uh, you know, brush him off, we don't want to come in on a Monday to have lunch with some monk. And three years later, those same editors were flying all the way from New York to Dharamsala just for 10 minutes with him. But nobody was aware exactly um, of what a treasure of, of centuries-old wisdom was available to the outside world for the first time uh, in, in history.